we start again. <coughs> So we had three processes, okay? Spontaneous emission. This we write the rate of spontaneous emission, density of states. This is a joint density of states now, okay? It's always joint density of states, one has to keep in mind. Probability of emission, the rate of stimulated emission. This is another Einstein's property. B. Again, probability of emission, and then there is an extra factor, which is the intensity of incident photons. Okay, what is stimulated emission? Stimulated emission is that light field or the field of light, electromagnetic field, it stimulates an emission when an electron is already in the excited state. So it pushes an electron from excited state to ground state. This is very counterintuitive. You see, when you shine light. You always think that the light will make a transition from a valence band to conduction band. You never think that it can actually make a transition from conduction band to valence band also. But Einstein said that this is equally probable. Okay? This is purely quantum mechanics. It was funny, Einstein never believed in the theory of quantum mechanics, but he himself started the theory of quantum mechanics. And then we have rate of stimulated absorption. It's similar to stimulated emission, except we have probability of absorption now and the light intensity. This is the intensity of light, incident radiation intensity. So, you knew incident radiation intensity. Now, A and B are Einstein coefficients which are related to each other by this equation. Where N is the refractive index. Okay. Now, let's start with rate of spontaneous emission. This looks complicated, we will simplify it. Let's call it equation number one. Now Marcel was talking about some approximations. This looks complicated. Now we have been drawing these diagrams. Now let me draw it here. There, this is EC, there is EB. Let's suppose the Fermi level is somewhere here. 
df. Let's suppose this is e2, some error e, e1. And this is the terminal. Now we can assume that e2 minus df is much larger than kt because at room temperature kt is 0 0.0258 electron volt. Okay? But this can be much larger because this is maybe half an electron volt, half an electron volt is much larger. Similarly, you can assume that E1, sorry, EF minus E1 is much larger than A B. This. Just an assumption. So this is called Boltzmann approximation. Why it's called Boltzmann approximation? Because in such an approximation, the Fermi Dirac distribution reduces to a Boltzmann distribution. Okay. So what happens in this case is, for example, E2 minus EF, when it's much larger than K, then this factor is much greater than 1. So 1 you can neglect. Then this becomes, it is from minus E2 minus EF. Okay. So this is Boltzmann distribution. You can think about that. So then what happens is, this Spontaneous emission rate, rate of spontaneous emission is 1 by tau r, 1 by pi h cross square, 2 m r is equal to equal to 2, h nu minus e g square root, e raised to minus h nu by g. This is what you will get in here where you apply this approximation. For example, you can neglect one thing. You can neglect this vector compared to this. So in the end, it will be E2 minus E1 by KT, or E1 minus E2 by KT minus H nu by KT. Because here, E2 minus E1 equals to H nu. This is what we have used here. So this is in Boltzmann approximation. Let's call it number two. Now we have talked about thermal equilibrium. Okay? In thermal equilibrium, you see that this expression has e raised to minus h nu by k. So there is a very large, uh, sorry, very small number in the denominator. Yeah, yeah. This is 25 mEV. This is some two electron volt. So this becomes a large number, e raised to a minus large number, which is a small quantity. So this is very small at thermal equilibrium, like we have been talking about. Now how we can increase this? We said that we can increase the rate in quasi-equilibrium, okay, where we assume two Fermi levels. Let me write equation for quasi-equilibrium. So in quasi-equilibrium, I am writing equilibrium like EQM, just for simplicity. A spontaneous emission rate is equal to this factor, this whole factor 2, okay, let me call it pH, thermal equilibrium. This becomes RSP, thermal equilibrium, multiplied by E raised to power EFC minus EFP. So these are the quasi Fermi levels divided by K. Now this becomes significant because this can be made comparable to K, like we were discussing. Okay, so this can become large. And it can increase the emission probability by orders of magnitude. If this is made larger than K, then this is a positive number. 
it increases the probability by many orders of magnitude than this. Okay? So in quasi equilibrium, we have large emission probability uh, rate, large emission rate possible. Now, I had promised you that we will drive the line shapes of emission, how the emission line would look like, okay, in the photoluminescence process. This is called photoluminescence process or emission process, okay. This is also called photoluminescence. In short, people very famously call it PL. You will hear everywhere photoluminescence spectroscopy, PL spectroscopy, and so on. We will check the emission of photons. Okay. So, in this equation, I can rewrite this equation as a form RSD in 1 by tau R into 1 by pi h tau square 2 m r is equal to 3 by 2. Now I multiply this and divide this equation. Multiply and divide by e raised to minus e g by e t. And then I have a vector this h mu minus e g. And I can write e raised to minus h mu minus e g. So I have done nothing. I have just done e to minus e g by kt and e to plus e g by kt. Okay. I want to make it as a function of h nu minus e g. This exponential also. This is why I have this one. So this factor, it, this factor doesn't depend on energy of incident light. Okay. So I can call it in thermal equilibrium some constant of spontaneous emission. I call it DDPHSP. Then let x equals to h nu minus e g in this equation. And p equals to 1 by k t. I am just putting this with my hand. Then what this equation becomes? RSP of nu equals to D thermal spontaneous square root of x e raised to power minus ax. This is a form of this equation. Okay? So this is the rate of emission. Let me plot this. Can I erase this? Maybe I can erase this. We have used this already there. So we can erase this. Let's plot this equation. So this is the rate of spontaneous emission. It has two components. One is square root of x and other is e raised to minus dx. Okay. Let's suppose this is my band E g. What is E g? So if h nu equals to E g, x is 0. Okay, so I can assume that x here is 0 and from here I can start plotting. So I have two functions. One is square root of x. Okay, other is e raised to minus dx. This is an exponentially decaying function and this comes like this. Okay. e raised to minus dx. And when you multiply them, what you get is something like this. This is how the emission line looks like, or is expected to look like. The reality can be a little bit different, but this is the best we can do at the moment. 
Okay, so at this point, where this emission intensity is maximum, this happens at Kg plus 1 by 2 Kg. Okay, this is energy axis, of course. Okay, and this point where this maximum intensity is, let's call it RSP max. Okay, so you have an exercise to do now. Okay, exercise. Prove that the energy for which the maximum of RSP mu appears is given by E equals to Eg plus Rkt. Okay? I will check this tomorrow. This is not difficult. You should be able to do it. You just have to find maximum of this function. Second thing. A very important terminology that we use in spectroscopy is called full width and half maximum. So, this is the maximum it's half maximum, it's somewhere there, half of the maximum, okay, so this is R S P max divided by 2, and the width in energy, this region is called full width at half maximum, full width, at half maximum. Exercise number two. Find F by U H L. Find the full width at half maximum. So what you have to do is you have to calculate which energies this curve strikes at a half and then you take a difference of these two energies. It might take you to use some computers, maybe. I'm just giving you a hint. Try it. Okay, let's proceed. So we have calculated so far rate of spontaneous emission. Now let's calculate what happens when you actually shine some light on the semiconductor. So we have written that rate of stimulated emission is V rho nu P D nu U nu and rate of absorption is P rho nu P A nu U nu. Let's suppose you have a semiconductor crystal. Do you have any questions so far? Everything is fine? Okay. Let's suppose you have a semiconductor crystal. Okay. Let's suppose this is Z direction, the direction of propagation of light. 
Let's suppose we put in some intensity of light. I knew some intensity of light. So I can write it z as a function of z where z equals to 0 here and z equals to L here, where L is the length of the disk. So now why I'm doing this? When you shine light on semiconductors, <coughs> the light starts to get absorbed as it move, as, as it is moving through a semiconductor and its intensity keeps on reducing if the absorption is positive. Okay? Then the intensity is as a function of z. It's not constant. It's varying as a function of z. And we will try to derive something called absorption coefficient, which tells you the measure at which this light is getting absorbed, the rate at which this light is getting absorbed. Okay? So, the rate of change of light intensity while passing through the crystal is rate of change of intensity derivative with respect to the z direction. It's given as c over n whole square divided by a by a mu square, where n is the refractive index. Rho nu over tau r p e nu minus. Okay, I have to erase this. P A U into I U. So this is the equation. You can find this equation in some textbooks. I will not derive because we are out of time. Then this factor, this does not depend on Z. There is no Z in this factor. This is independent of Z. Let me call it gamma 0 nu because it depends on nu for sure. So then I have del i nu over del z equals to gamma 0 nu i nu. Okay. What is the solution of this differential equation? Anyone? Anyone? Yes. It's exponential. So I nu of z equals to I nu of zero is to a gamma zero nu of z in multiplied by z. So the intensity reduces if there is absorption as a function of z according to this equation but it can also happen that the intensity increases as a function of z if there is amplification what I mean is if gamma is positive then this factor is positive so this will keep on increasing as a function of z this is contradictory right? this is contradictory this is the amplification. This is how lasing happens. Okay? Because you shine some light and then it keeps on collecting light coherently. And what emits out of this is much more than what you have already shown. Okay. But if this is negative, then there is absorption. Because the intensity keeps on reducing. So we will see this in a moment. So if gamma is positive, then what happens is P E nu is greater than P A nu for gamma nu greater than zero. See? Right? So then in that case the 
emission probability is larger than absorption probability. So you have amplification. And you define the gain of amplification as phi mu L over phi mu 0 equals to E raised to gamma L, where gamma is the gain coefficient. Okay? Very, very counterintuitive. But this is how the industry works. This is how the laser works. Again, gamma was that. The time we're going to write that again. We have written right there. So we have gamma there. So let's suppose there is no emission. Okay? No emission. Only absorption. If you have only absorption, in that case, P E mu equals zero. Okay? Light is entering inside. But the material is not emitting as well. In this situation, I can write gamma equals to minus C over N whole square, right? A by whole square, rho mu over tau R, P A mu, and I call it minus of alpha, where this is alpha, and this is the absorption coefficient. Yes, if there is no emission, then you can write that P e, is, uh, P e nu is 0, meaning this is 0, then there is minus P a nu. And this negative comes in front, and this whole quantity I call alpha. And then in that case, in that case, I can write, I nu z equals to I nu 0 e raised to power minus alpha z. This is the equation of absorption in a semiconductor. Okay? Equation of absorption. And alpha is what you measure in experiment in the absorption step. So when you measure absorption spectrum, you find alpha. Okay, let me plot this equation. Let me plot absorption coefficient. So I have written absorption coefficient like this, alpha. Let me make it a slightly amplified plot in this direction because we need to do something. Okay, so there are two factors here. One is nu square. Okay, what I am doing is, I am plotting alpha as a function of energy. Energy is h nu. Right, so there is a nu square there. So this nu square, or h nu square, goes like this. Or 1 by h nu square. 1 by h nu square. This goes like this, this contribution. And then there is another thing, which is the density of states. Okay, I have erased that. But there, there has to be a density of states to find the total number of absorption processes. <coughs> so this goes as root e. Okay, we can write this equation again. Let me find another so as you are not confused. No, it's there. This row okay. This is the density of states. Okay, so this goes as root of E. This is your E energy here. So then, 
what we expect is the multiplication of these two goes something like this. Okay. So this is how the absorption coefficient in a semiconductor should look like. However, the reality is different. I told you we are doing the, we are trying to do the best we can in this limited field, but the reality in experiment is different. Let me plot the reality. Alpha. Let me plot some numbers like 10, 10 is by 2, 10 is by 3, 10 is by 4, 10 is by 5, and these are these numbers are per centimeter. So this is the extinction coefficient per centimeter. Let's suppose this energy is 1 electron volt, 2 electron volt, 3, 4 electron volt. Then what's the band gap of germanium? Someone remembers? From last class. You should try to revise what we do. Okay, germanium is 0 0.66. It lies somewhere there. In experiment, if you measure, if you check the absorption spectrum of germanium, it first increases like this, then it sharply increases, and then it goes this. Okay, this is germanium. 0 0.66 electron volt. What's the band gap of silica? 1.1. Right somewhere there. This again goes slowly like this till some point. And then it sharply increases and goes this way. Okay, what's the band gap of gallium arsenide? Yeah, you are correct. 1.42. 1.4 is somewhere here. What gallium arsenide does is slightly different. It sharply first rises. And then it goes this way. Okay. Indium phosphide, if anyone remembers. Okay, let me write here. Silicon. Gallium arsenide. Indium phosphide is 1.36. Somewhere there. Indium phosphide again does this. Gallium phosphide 2.26. So this was indium phosphide, this is gallium phosphide. It slowly increases and then it goes this. Gallium nitride. Anyone? 3.3 .3 is there. Gallium nitride does similar to gallium arsenide. It sharply increases, then it goes this. Okay, so what we were expecting is that absorption would come down like this, but it goes up. There are other differences, like there are some semiconductors which are doing this, some are rising sharply. Why? What is the difference between the dotted lines and, and the solid lines? What is the difference between these and the solid lines? Right. Which one is direct? Which ones are direct? Those which are rising sharply. Why? Okay. In that, in the direct band gap semiconductor. You have a transition which is happening directly in the case case at k equals to 0. There is a large joint density of states immediately available to the photons. 
when it hits this. You have a sharp increase. But for indirect bearing of semiconductor, such as this, this is an indirect bearing of semiconductor. You need photon, phonons. You need phonons for absorbing. Or you have transition like this, but the joint density of states of such transition is small. Okay. So what happens is that in, it first slowly rises, and then it meets the direct gap. First it slowly rises up to this point. All these transitions happen. And when it, as soon as it hits there, immediately it rises. But here it does not happen. Okay. Now the question is, why does this thing deviate from the calculated behavior? There are a few reasons to this. Number one, we are ignoring all the indirect gaps in the theory. The theory is all about direct band gap. Okay, the calculations, they are all about direct band gaps. Direct gap calculation. Okay. But the problem is there is always an indirect gap in the materials. Okay, so then you need phonons. And if you look at the theory of phonon assisted processes, which we will not do, that's very complicated. Yes. Then this alpha absorption coefficient, it turns out to be some constant K1 plus K2 as a function of temperature, okay, multiplied by H nu minus Eg whole square. So there is a square term. See here this was a square root term. This is a square term. And what does the square term do? If you have some band gap Eg here, then this takes the absorption like this. At some temperature, let's say T0. If you raise temperature, this goes like this, where this is T1 greater than T0. If you raise it further, takes like this, where T2 greater than T1 for larger time. For example, this is tens power 1, tens power 2. Okay, alpha, or something. So this process, when added to this, somehow comes closer to N. Okay? Now, this was all for bulk semiconductor. We will for 5 or 7 minutes discuss two dimensional semiconductors. Okay? Then we will take a break today. Enough for today. Two D semiconductors. In two D semiconductors, we have been making such quantum well like diagrams. Here we have a state here. This grid stays here, this is the z direction, this is energy. Right? And then there can be a transition here. I write EG1, EGW1, and this I write EGW2, and this is the band gap. The actual band gap of power. And then we were doing plotting the density of states. For bulk. This was like this, root E. This is for bulk. But for 2D semiconductor, this was a step like the Okay. Again, this is energy, this is density of states. Joint density of states. I'm talking about optical processes on the ground. Okay. Now for quantum 
orthonels or 2D semiconductors, the absorption coefficient turns out to be this. C by N whole square divided by A pi to power R 2 MR over H cross LZ nu square where this was a joint density of states in quantum realm. Okay. In 3D it's directly proportional to uh, root of energy, square root of energy, but in 2D it's not depending on energy, it's constant. multiplied by absorption probability. Okay. And if you plot this, again expectation from theory, what I am expecting from theory is the following. If you have an energy gap Eg, then again like in 3D case, I have a new square or 1 by new square goes like this. 1 by H new square. This is energy H new. And then you have this density of states which is constant which we plotted just here. Okay, step like function. Then what you expect is the product of these two is this. This falls slightly, this first step, and then it makes a second step, then it goes third step, and so on. This is the expected absorption coefficient. Let, we can write some numbers here. 10 is per 2, 10 is per 3, 10 is per 4, and so on. Alpha percent. This is the expectation. What happens in reality? Let me consider the case of gallium arsenide quantum well. Okay? Where this well is made of gallium arsenide. Let's suppose it's 10 nanometer thick well. Okay? And Z here is 10 nanometer. This barrier is aluminium gallium arsenide. So this is the barrier. And this is the value. Okay? Then, reality. What happens in the experiment? In experiment, what you see, okay, I am towards the end. In experiment, the gallium arsenide quantum well, band gap, 3D band gap. Okay, sorry. I should plot the absorption. The 3D absorption, it looked like this. We plot it something like this, right? So this is x per 1, x per 2, x per 3, x per 4, alpha. But in the case of quantum well, the reality looks very much similar to this, okay? Very close. At some higher energy, at EGW1, this rises. Then there is a small wiggle. It rises again. There is a small wiggle. It slightly falls. Rises again. Like this. Okay? Looks very close. But what are these wiggles? What is this? Any idea? We will discuss about this in next class. But what is this? This is a very important thing. This is an excipron. Okay, I will tell you what this is. So this is a peak which is coming from excipron. An excipron is a Coulomb bound electron and hole pair. You create electrons and holes, but they are charged particles and they bound with each other just like hydrogen. So this is a, I can write it here. Okay, 
So this is an exciton, and this exciton, since it's bound, it has a binding energy. I call it Pb. In gallium arsenide quantum wells, this is nearly 10 MeV. So what happens is, if you have a band structure where you have a band here, Eg. So this is in gallium arsenide quantum wells. Let me consider a bulk semiconductor. If you create an electron and a hole here, and they are bound by Coulomb attraction, then there is a binding energy which attracts. So it reduces the energy. You know, attraction always brings the energy down. Things try to attract to come to a more stable state. So then, there is a state here which corresponds to the exciton. So the exciton starts to absorb energy a few MeV below the actual band here. Yeah, this I this band here I call optical band here. So meaning Eg equals to E optical plus E binding, binding energy of exciton, where this is the binding energy. It turns out that in quantum wells, the excitons are more tightly bound than in, in 3D materials, like in bulk cases. Okay? In fact, in quantum wells, binding energy of exciton in 2D is nearly four times binding energy in 3D. Okay? Theoretically. Reality is slightly different. In reality, this is like 10 to 12 MeV, and this is like 4 MeV for gallium arsenide. Okay? And then, one last point. Like in hydrogen atom, you have a positive ion. Okay, let me come there. You have a positive ion and then there is a negative electron. Okay, this is a proton and electron. This is called oneness state. Similarly, there is a positive and then there is a second shell. Electron is here. Now. This is 2s state. Similarly, 3s state. Okay, this is 3s. So, you see, in these excited states, these are called excited states of hydrogen atom, the electron and pole are away from each other. Okay? And in that case, the binding energy reduces for excited states. So, what happens is, let's like suppose this is zero of energy and this is the energy of continuum where everything is free, electron is not bound to hold. Then, this is the ground state of hydrogen atom, 1s. This is 2s, then this is 3s, this is 4s, and so on, you know, 5s, 6s, and 7s. Do you know what is this energy in hydrogen atom? What is the binding energy of hydrogen atom? Any one of you. So, this is the hydrogen atom bound here and here it's free meaning electron is kicked out how much energy is required to kick an electron out from the influence of proton yes how much is this ok let me give you a example it's 13.1 electron volt binding energy of hydrogen right you see, here it's just 4 MeV. It has reduced a lot by many orders of magnitude. There are two reasons. One is the effective mass. In this case, it is much smaller than hydrogen atom. Other is the dielectric constant. Okay? So, binding energy is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught whole sphere. Next. 
and then there is one over epsilon square and this is the effective mass okay so this is the binding energy it is negative now in the case of these materials effective mass is very less okay for example for an x atom the effective mass in the case of barium mass like is 0.067 multiplied by 0.1 divided by 0.067 plus 0.1 you can uh, i am forgetting this number probably it's something like 0.035 something like this so it's much smaller than one okay it has already reduced by two orders of magnitude here and then there is this epsilon in semiconductors this epsilon can vary between let's say 5 to 15 very easily normally in this gallium arsenide and so it's of the order of 13 or 14 i am forgetting the actual number so when you take its square again its two orders of magnitude 100 at the bottom so two 100 goes from here 100 goes from here so it's reduced reduced by a lot by many orders of magnitude so hexicons are relatively weakly bound they are hydrogen atom still they behave like hydrogen atom do you see there are these bigger other so this is one s state this is a two s state and so on there would be three s four s before the actual band gap starts but normally two s three s and four s states they are merged with the band gap because they have this broadening of light so you cannot resolve it they are very close to the band gap in that case this will be the band gap okay and then let me give you one last point when you apply magnetic field which we come to next class immediately then you are able to move these excited states in energy then what happens is you start to see in magnetic field you start to see the spectrum to change let me make it with a red marker in magnetic field the spectrum starts to behave like this for example yeah so then if this is 1s this is 2s this is 3s this is 4s and so on the excited states they spread in energy they move in energy with magnetic field towards towards the blue side towards higher energy side so magnetic field is one way to probe these excited states of excitons and this is called rydberg spectroscopy rydberg spectroscopy probing excited states of excitons okay i think we can still spend one last minute to just close this then i will not have to do this again in the next class Let's 